that the trees have legs, then what if? What if? What about if this was her tree? Oh, shit, sorry. Look, I have to board now, but think about that. The trees have names, and one of them is hers. I have to run. Monday, 9.35 a.m. You know who this is. You leave the device in a small truck in the back of the building. You get the truck from Barry. Barry will contact you with more instructions. Monday, 11.51 a.m.
summons a river. Your these are the basic ingredients. And a river running through it. And a river, exactly, running through a great European city. And a couple at the water's edge. These are the basic ingredients. The woman. Young and beautiful. Natural. The man. Older. Troubled. Sensitive. Natural. A naturally sensitive man. Nevertheless, a man of power and authority. He knows what they're doing is wrong. They both know this is wrong. They both know this is wrong, but they just can't help themselves exactly. They're making love in the man's apartment. Doing what? Making love. They're making love in the man's apartment, a luxury apartment, naturally, with a view over the entire city. These are the basic ingredients. A panoramic view of the entire city. The charming rooftops, the quaint chimneys, the skylights. And as you look through the TV areas, you can see the monuments of culture. The Duomo of Florence, the Arch and Ladder Fonts, Brandenburg Gate, Nelson's Column, to name but four. The woman cries out. Her golden hair cascades, as it were, over the edge of the bed. She grips the bed frame, her knuckles whiten. There are tears in her eyes. The apartment is beautifully furnished. Obviously the apartment will be beautifully furnished. Obviously it would have high ceilings and tall windows and date, in all probability, date back to the end of the 19th century, when the rise in speculative building coincided with the aspirations of the liberal bourgeois Create monumental architectural schemes such as, I think in particular now, such as the Viennese Ringstrass, which made such an impression on a young Adolf Hitler while he stood for the morning before the opera. Or one of the great Parisian boulevards. Or one of the great, exactly, Parisian boulevards. And as you say, her golden hair cascades off the edge of the bed, she grips the bed frame, her knuckles whiten, her pupils widen. When he. Let's say he grunts. Grunts. Let's say he grunts, yes, but sensitive. The sensitive grunt of an attractive man, power and authority. Not, for example, the coarse, pig-like grunt of a mechanic lying on his back in a confined space, trying to loosely and cross-threaded nut with a heavy and inappropriate size wrench. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But the masterful grunt of a man who breakfasts in one continent, a lunch in another, who flies first class with a white linen napkin, and a comprehensive wine list. That kind of man. That kind of grunt. That kind of light. What kind of light? The kind of light that streams in. It streams in through the tall windows, transforming their bodies into a kind of golden mass. A rainbow mass. The light. The golden mass. These are the essential ingredients. But then a look crosses her face. What? A look of doubt. A look of doubt. Yes, good. Crosses Anne's face. Even now, even now in the intensity of her passion. Even now in the intensity of her passion, a kind of shadow crosses her face. A premonitory shadow. Premonitory? A premonitory shadow. Yes, crosses her face. Is that a word? Is what a word? Well, of course, premonitory is a word. Later, night, the light of the city at night, strings of light, suspended starlight along the keys and the frameworks of bridges, or direct warning lights pulsing on the tops of tower blocks and TV transmitters. The man at the telephone, his lowered voice, his troubled glances. Anne wakes up in the solid moon of bed. She hears his faint male voice in the adjoining room. The exquisite Louis Cortez clock strikes three by means of a tiny, tiny naked guilt ship. Striking a tiny, tiny golden bell, held between the teeth of an enamelled wolf. No doubt a reference to the ancient myth, only known by the 17th century French nobility, only to be lost by human consciousness. Ting, ting, ting. 3 a.m. Anne wakes, hears voice, light cigarette, enters the doorway. Dial. Who was it, she says? No one, he says. Who the fuck was it, she says? End of dialogue. And now she's angry. Yes, end of dialogue. And now she's angry. She's angry because she knows exactly who it is. His political masters calling him. His political masters. Exactly calling him. Just as they have always called him. 
towards him. The very political masters that she hates with every fibre of her being. The very men and women that she and, in her youthful idealism, holds responsible for the terminal injustice of this world. The leaders who, in her naive and passionate opinion, have destroyed everything she values in the name A of a business and B of laissez faire. In the name of A, rationalisation, and B, enterprise. In the name A, so-called individualism, and B, so-called choice. The basic ingredients, in other words, of a whole tragedy. A whole, exactly, tragedy unfolds before our eyes. In Paris, Prague, Venice or Berlin, to name but four. As the moon, vast and orange, rises over the Renaissance domes, Baroque palaces, 19th century zoos and railway stations, and modernist slabs of social housing exemplifying the dictum form follows function. Form follows function. She stubs out the cigarette. She begins to shout. She begins to beat him with her fists. She begins to bite him with her teeth. She begins to kick him with her big white feet. She beats and beats and beats and beats and beats until the exquisite clock that has survived two revolutions and three centuries is smashed to pieces on the smoothly polished parquet as she beats, bites and kicks. And the tiny, tiny shepherds and the tiny, tiny bells both vanish. Vanish forever to the warm-up bed Until she stops for breath, let's say, shall we? At this point, she stops for breath. The woman. The woman, Anne, yes, stops for breath. And he? Bows his head. He ends. Looks up at her. He ends. Takes her tear-stained face between his hands. Takes Anne's tear-stained face between his hands like a precious chance. Or a rugby football. Like a precious silver chance. Or a rugby football. Or a drop game. He takes Anne's angry, tear-stained face between his hands. He still loves him. For all of their biological differences, that's right, he still loves her. Speech. One day, Anne, you'll understand my world. One day, Anne, you'll understand that everything must be paid for. Even your ideals must be paid for. End of speech. At which point he smooths the wet strands of hair from her lips and kisses her. These are the basic kisses her and presses her back down onto the bed. Or she him. Better still, she presses him back down into the bed. Such is her emotional confusion. Such is her sexual appetite. Such is her inability to distinguish between right and wrong in this great consuming passion. In the high ceiling department, with a solid walnut bed, the polished carpet floor, the grand piano by Cleo Serpa, 1923. Without it, she would perhaps be noted by any risky means of protection against pregnancy. In the case of Anne, or in the case of either against sexual transmitted diseases, including the so-called AIDS virus, more correctly known as the human immune deficiency virus, or HIV short. A portrait of a young girl sketching, once thought to be by David, but now attributed to his female contemporary Constance Charpenter, and a triangular yellow ashtray containing three cigarette butts and a quantity of fine grey ash. A great tragedy, in other words, of love. A great, exactly. Mm. Tragedy of ideology and love. These are the basic ingredients. The whole of the past is there in a face. It's written there like a history. The history of her family, the history of the land itself, this land where her family have lived for generations. It's a valley. It's a valley, yes. Deep in the hills. It's a valley. Deep in the hills. Where the traditional ways have been maintained for generations. And there are fruit trees. And each child who is born there has a fruit tree planted in their name. There's a kind of ceremony. A formal. Exactly. Ceremony. There's a kind of formal ceremony that takes place in the valley. And the generations upon generations of this formal ceremony of naming has taken place on the birth of each child. The trees, in other words, have names. Just as the inhabitants have names. There is the person and there is the tree. 
there's Annie the woman and there's Annie the tree. The trees have names, and so do the blades, the blades of grass. Because life is so precious, life is so sacred, things are so alive, so precious that even the blades of grass have names. It's something we can hardly comprehend. We can hardly comprehend this sacred, sacred life. This sense of completeness is beyond our understanding. This sense of all humbles us. But now, devastation. What? Devastation. The harmony of generations has been destroyed. Exactly. This secure and closed world has been torn apart. The harmony of generations has been destroyed. The women have been raped and the children have been disemboweled. But the women have been raped and then disemboweled. The men have hacked each other to pieces. Brother has killed brother. A cousin has murdered cousin. Brother has raped sister. Brother has raped, yes, sister. And now the dogs are picking up the remains. And the, the petrol that was used to fuel the ancient tractors and generate electricity for the old black and white TVs has been used to set people alight. Yes. First, to set people alight. And then, for safety reasons, to burn the corpses. Living people set on fire, the cold vapour of the petrol and the hot rush of the flame. Burning people running, blazing between the fruit trees which bear their names. <clears throat> While the soldiers stand by, laughing. The soldiers are laughing, even though these are their own cousins. Their own parents. Their mothers and fathers. Burning their own parents in the sacred orchard. Burying them alive and laughing. Or burying them alive. Burying them alive up to their necks in the fertile earth and then smashing their skulls in with a spade. They have a name for this. The flower. It's called, that's right, the flower. And it's all there in her face. It's what? All there. In Anya's face, we don't need words. She is beyond words. Her mouth, in fact, her mouth trembles, but no words come. The inadequacy of words. The terrifying, yes, inadequacy of words, as she stands beside a tree covered in delicate white petals. A plum. A plum tree, yes, covered in delicate white petals, which is the moment. Yes. The moment we realize that this is her tree. Tree. Anya's tree, planted what, 40, 50 years ago on the day of her birth, the hole dug out by her father, the roots spread out by her mother and watered and tended by her family, who now lie dead. Her very own tree. The easel smells of petrol. It's spring. Panorama of the whole valley. The whole deep valley in spring. The trees, the grass. A bee. And then she speaks. Yes. Because she must, because the words well up. She stands beside her tree. The tree gives her strength, the strength to speak. She points to some charred timbers. That, she says, was my home. My children were hiding. Under the bed, they killed them both. First the boy, and then the girl. They set a light to my little girl's hair. I still don't know why they set light to my little girl's hair. They crackled like a pile of sticks. Then she breaks down. Who? Hey, Anya! She screams, she breaks down and scratches her cheeks like something from an ancient tragedy. I don't think so. I don't think Anya screams. I don't think she breaks down and scratches her cheeks like something from an ancient tragedy. I think her eyes blaze. I think she advances towards the camera and begins to curse. You motherfucking shit-faced murderers! She says, 
You pig fucking cock sucking bastards. You sister fucking blaspheming child murdering minus fuck those killers. I spit on your graves and on the graves of your mothers and fathers and curse all future generations. She's angry, she's very angry. She's very angry, but she has every right to be. She has, well, obviously, a right to be angry. Everything destroyed. A way of life destroyed. A relationship with nature destroyed. And this is why we sympathise. Of course we sympathise. Not just sympathise, but empathise. Empathise because, <clears throat> yes, Anya's valley is our valley. Anya's trees are our trees. Anya's family is the family to which we all belong. So, it's a universal thing. Obviously, it's a universal thing. Where we strangely recognise ourselves, our own world, our own pain, our own anger. A universal thing which strangely... What? What? Which strangely restores. Which strangely restores. I think it does, yes. Our faith in ourselves. She's the kind of person that believes the message on a till receipt. Thank you for your custom. She never stands forward at its notice. Never. Or speaks to the driver. When a letter comes addressed to the occupier, she first of all makes, what, a cup of tea? Yes. Then sits at the kitchen table to open it. She opens it and reads it as carefully as if it were a letter from her own son, who now lives in America. Canada, actually. She's the kind of person who believes the lucky numbers have been selected. Toronto. Just for her. Which, in a way, of course, they have. And if she replies within ten days, she'll receive a mystery gift. Toronto. Is it? mystery gift, no. She takes a box, she takes a box and selects the gift that she wants to receive. Maybe a handy clock radio, a camera, or a, a set of miniature screwdrivers. A set of miniature screwdrivers or a handy disposable camera. She's a non-smoker. She's definitely a non-smoker. Although I think it's true to say she may occasionally take cigarettes from other people. Exactly. At parties. Exactly. And parties, music. Dimensionality of all the things that Anne can be, all the things that Anne can be. What is Hecuba to him? What he to Hecuba? A megastar, a megastar. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. We need to fantasize. We need to improvise. We need to synthesize. We need to advertise that we are the good guys. We are the good guys. We say we want to be overwhelmed by the sheer quantity, yes, the sheer quantity of all the things that Anne can be, of all the things that Anne can be. 
What is Hecuba to her? What is she to Hecuba? A megastar. A megastar. The fuck you are. The camera loves you. The camera loves you. The camera, the camera. The camera, the camera. The camera, the camera. The camera loves you. Couch, 
and say, let's take a look then, Anne, shall we? The same Anne came away from the hospital with a wooden box containing a bag which go beside the bed, two stiff squares of metal balls and a number of black wires. The same Anne who woke each subsequent night to the sound of the horrible bells in the horrible wet sheets. The same Anne who now, what? Stands there, stands there in front of these serious men and women with witnesses and evidence in sealed plastic bags, false passports and pieces of human flesh, stands there and refuses to recognise their authority. Pieces of human flesh, false passports, lists of names, traces of explosives, tapes of phone calls, videotapes from banks, shopping malls and cash dispensers, psychiatric reports which confirm A, her intelligence and B, his sanity. She goes about her work, they say, with the terrible detachment of an artist. Witnesses break down in tears. Witnesses break down in tears as videotapes from banks and shopping malls show Anne as just one more case of going about her business and constant surveillance until 20 minutes after she's left, the plain glass blows out the shoe shop window in absolute silence. And the little grey figures breaking apart fly through the air in absolute silence with the tiny, tiny shoes are in fact real humans mixed with glass. No one can find out your motive. No one can find Anne's motive. She lives alone. She lives alone. She works alone. She works alone. She sleeps alone. Apparently, yes. Kills alone. Eats. She lives, works, sleeps, kills, and eats entirely on her own. In fact, her recorded phone calls consist almost entirely of orders for meals to be delivered to the room she rented overlooking the high streets of metropolitan suburbs. A large pizza, garlic bread, and one and a half litres of Diet Pepsi, all for £9.99. Calls which were, at first, assumed to be coded messages. Calls which, are, at first, are assumed to be which are in fact orders for meals delivered to her door by boys and scooters and paid for in cash. Is this really the same thing for Anne, who now has witnesses breaking down in tears, who has long serving officers of both sexes, receiving counselling for the night sweats, impotence, a memory of trembling hands, and flashbacks of human heads popping open as if in slow motion, and the long, long, terrible wear of a buried and reachable child Reoccurring as a kind of what's the word? An auditory hallucination. Yes. For which they're now demanding to be compensated. Is this the same man that woke up when the bell went? And watch the shadow of the chestnut trees move on in bedroom wall in her wet pajamas? The same man who soldered fiddly tapping mechanisms and no retail switches to printed serial calls with her mouth full of deep pan pizza. Who summed up the mood of generation who appeared twice on the cover of Vogue magazine, who sold the film rights for two and a half million US dollars, who studied in depth the baggage claim procedures and memorised the timetables of the principal international airlines, who was quote a loner unquote, who listens quote expressionlessly unquote to the description of quote outrage unquote after quote, outrage, unquote, after quote, outrage, unquote, that she has perpetrated. Yes.
It's one of those bittersweet things, those laughing through tears things. After all this time, after so many years, he finally comes back to his mum. And at first, you know, like, who is this? And then there's the moment of realisation. Oh God, it's my very own son. And they're helping each other, right there in the kitchen. And you know, it's so moving. I mean, it's just so moving to see that he has found that thing, that strength to forgive his mum. He has forgiven her her alcoholism. He has forgiven her for running around with other men. He has forgiven her for destroying his father's faith in himself and driving him to suicide. And they're both kind of crying and laughing and crying again. <coughs> All at the same time, in the same kitchen, he sat in as a small boy, witnessing his parents' terrible arguments. His dad in tears, pouring her liquor down the sink at 10 o'clock in the morning. While well, she screams that, if he were a real man, one iota of self-respect, she would have need to bruise herself to death, would she? And there are these tiny scratches on the table. He recalls how they made secretly but before. And you're aware, you know, of the like the continuity of things, of the bittersweetness of things. And then he says, Hey, Mum, I've got a surprise for you. Mum kind of breaks away and wipes her tears and says, What surprise? And then he says, Look out the window, Mum. And out of the window, there's this like dusty pickup with these two tiny, tiny kids in the back, just staring, staring straight into the camera. And she can hardly believe that these are her very own grandchildren. And then he says, Mum, I want you to meet Annie. And that's when this woman, Annie, gets out of the pickup. And she is like really tall and fair and strong limbed with these clear blue eyes that can see straight into your heart. And I guess she's every man's dream of what the woman should be. And every mother's dream of the wife that she would choose for her son. And it turns out how he and Abby and the kids have been making this new... What? Well... Life. They've been making this new, yes, life for themselves, away from the city, living off the land, growing stuff, trapping stuff, boring under the earth in clean, pure water, in the belief that man is free before God to forge his own destiny and use whatever means necessary to protect his family. And over lunch, which is basically a kind of chicken salad with laying eggs, we learn <coughs> How he is, in fact, the commanding officer of a whole group of like-minded individuals who have armed themselves, not out of any thirst for blood, but out of necessity. Because this is war. War, says Mum. What do you mean, war? So Anne has to explain to Mum that they don't believe in taxes or welfare or any of that shit. How the war is a war against the government, who take the bread out of the working man's hands and give it to pornographers and abortionists of this world. It's a war against the God-forsaken faggots. It's a war against the crack dealers in the blacks. It's a war against the conspiring Jews and their attempts to rewrite history. It's a crusade against all the degenerate images that masquerade as art. It's a war against all those who would deny our right to bear arms. And Annie has this, like, inner light. It's like, wow. She's cut. She's cut. She's cut through all the confusion and chattering voices of our lives, of our time. 
and has found this kind of really what thing, I guess. This thing, this like absolute thing. It's like she's found this thing. It's like, hey, Annie just found this thing, this key. Yes, this key thing, this secret this certainty and simplicity, this secret and simple thing that we search for throughout our lives, which is, I guess, the truth. Yes. And it's kind of moving to see how attentive he is to the kids, that he's the one that's cutting up their chicken and wiping their mouths with paper napkins. The image, you know, of this big guy in camouflage doing all that caring domestic stuff. Family is the heart of things, I guess. And then one of the tiny, tiny kids look up at him and asks him, why is she crying? And it's true. His mother is crying. As she sat there at the family table, gazing at this family she never knew she had. Her son and his fine wife, their two innocent children who have their whole lives ahead of them. And she is indeed crying her eyes out like a tiny child herself. And Danny strokes the boy's hair, which is clipped real short. You know, like a real young soldier. And says, because she is so happy, son. Because she is so happy. Being a 
point. It is surely a search for a point is pointless. And the whole point of this exercise, i.e. these attempts on her life, points to that. It reminds me of the old Chinese proverb, the darkest place is always under the lamp. Thick, angry, needle, to swim, journey, blue, lamp, to sing, bread, rich, tree, to prick, pity, yellow, mountain, to die, salt, new, custom, to pray. The what? The darkest place is Chinese. Ugh. Why can't students learn to draw? Why can't students learn to paint? Students should be taught skills, not ideas. For what we have here is clearly the birth of a girl who should not have been admitted to art school, but to a psychiatric unit. Money, stupid, exercise book, to the spa, finger, dear, bird, to fall, book, unjust, frog, to part, hunger, white, child, to pay attention, pencil, sad, clog, to marry. A what? A mental hospital, somewhere where she could receive treatment. Well, I have to say, I think that's an extraordinary remark, which I wouldn't expect to hear outside the police. What? Please, Emily, oh. no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This has to be said, which appears to be an attempt to reinstate the notion of undoubted ghost. Oh, what? what an absurd overreaction. To so called generic after being demolished, hired on pizza, prohibited by the Nazis. I mean, listen to yourselves. You are saying that this artist should not be allowed to produce work. But should it simply be compelled to undergo psychiatric treatment? And of course, the just not this poor girl. Yeah. This poor girl, yeah, requires help. And we have not, as well you know, at any point suggested she should be compelled. Oh, really? And in whose opinion? The opinion of Goebbels? <laughs> the opinion, perhaps, of Joseph Stalin? Isn't Ed actually anticipating the terrifying consequences of that question and asking us what help? Really means? And she's saying, I don't need your help. And she's saying, your help oppresses me. And she's saying, the only way to avoid becoming a victim in the patriotic structures of 20th century capitalism is to become her own victim. Aren't these the true meanings of these attempts on her life? Her own victim? That's fascinating. Oh, really? This is such bloody sure. reasoning. Oh, sure. House, darling, glass, to bottle, big. Bird, colored to paint, heart, old, flower to beat, box, wild, family to wash, gal, friend, happiness to lie. Well, I think, whatever the very very personal agendas we bring to this, there's one thing that we're all agreed on. It's a landmark work. It's moving. It's timely. It's distressing. It's fun. It's sick. It's sexy. It's deeply serious. But at the same time, raises vital questions about the world we're living in. That is some flabby reasoning. Her own victim. If she really is, as it appears, trying to kill herself, then surely our presence here makes us mere voyeurs in bedlam. If, on the other hand, she's only play acting, then the whole work becomes a mere cynical performance and is doubly disgusting. But why not? Why can it not be a performance? Exactly. It becomes a kind of theatre. It's a theatre, that's all right. In a world where theatre itself is dying, instead of the outmoded conventions of dialogue and so called characters lumbering towards the values of Jenny Mars and theatre, and is offering us a pure dialogue of objects, a blender of glass and vaseline of steel and blood, saliva and chocolate. She is offering us no less than the pure spectacle of life itself. The radical pornography. Ooh. If I may use that old news word. A man broken, abused, almost Christ and Paul. An object, in other words, a religious object. An object of herself. Yes. Not the object of others. The object of herself. That is the scenario she offers us. But haven't we really seen that? Haven't we already seen that in the so-called radicalism of the 60s, stroke 70s? Deportment, narrow, brother, to fear, false, storm, anxiety, to kiss, bride, pure, door, to choose, 
had continued ridicule to sleep, month, nights, woman to abuse. Human world, where the gestures of radicalism take on a new meaning, where the radical gesture is simply one more form of entertainment, i.e., one more product, in this case, an artwork, to be consumed. I fear there is no minute to go with it, and I bitterly resent the implication that I'm some sort of Nazi. Strangely. So, what? 
Yes. Sorry. Strangely, as you say, the light from the torch reveals on the back seat of the vehicle only two black, shiny plastic bags, each tied at the neck, but no child whatsoever. Child? What child? And now she's mumbling something about... Speak up! Something about a garden swing. Something about her little girl, her little Anne, her little Lucia. Something... What? Speak up! Something about her little girl being in the back and her knees, her urgent knees taking those bags to the airport with her education and her bank account in US dollars and buy air tickets. Doesn't she realise the airport's closed? Didn't she hear the runway being bombed? Didn't she see the intelligent rockets splash at the concrete like stones and being dropped into a pool? Strangely. Can she feel the white heat of the moon aviation fuel? No. Strangely, as you say, she seems to think the airport is functioning normally. Strangely, she still seems to think that the world's white beaches and cosmopolitan cities are still a few hours away by regular scheduled flights. Strangely. This nameless woman strangely seems to imagine she can still operate a bank account with a plastic card and fly first class with little Anne, little Anushka, out of the range of rifles and axes to a city full of art galleries, halogen lamps, charming cafes and attractively displayed shoes. Strangely. And yet, strangely, no one asks her what she means by Anushka being in the bags. Strangely. And yes, strangely, no one asks us to examine the bags. Strangely. And yes, most strangely perhaps of all, that no one should question whether well, the child should be in two bags as opposed to one. Strangely.
want to see, do you have an appointment? He shoots her through the mouth. He shoots her through the mouth and goes down the corridor. Quite quickly. Goes, good, yes. Quite quickly down the corridor. Opens the first door he finds. Walks straight in. Walks straight in. Yes, says the teacher. How can I help you? He shoots him through the heart. He shoots the teacher right through the heart. Children, they don't understand. They don't immediately grasp what's happened. What's happened to their teacher. They don't understand. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Nothing like this has ever happened before. But they do understand. Of course they understand. They've seen this on TV. They've stayed up late. It's a special treat. They've seen this on TV. They know exactly what's going on. And that is why they back away. They instinctively back away. The worst thing they can do is back away. But they back away. They back away against the wall. Against their pictures on the wall. My house. My cat. Me and my cat. My house. My cat. Me and my cat me in a tree. And it's interesting to see the way in which some of them hold hands. And it's interesting to see the way in which some of them hold hands. They instinctively hold hands. The way children do. The way a child does. If you walk next to one and hold out your own, it will grasp your hand. Not like an adult who will flinch away. Unless it's someone who loves you. A loved one. Anyone else will flinch away. Just like the child now does. Just as child A now flinches away from... Yes? From the warm metal. From the warm metal. Thank you. Of the gun. Just as child A now flinches away from the warm metal of the gun. He shoots child A in the head. Let's say, let's just say, the trees have names, okay? 
That's right, the tree. You think? I, I know you think I'm crazy, but let's just accept for a moment, shall we? That the trees have names. Then what if? What if? What about if this is her tree? Oh shit, sorry. Look, I have to pause now. Think about that. 